in a minute. Well, good evening, everyone, and um, thanks for joining us um, for tonight's live stream um, with Bob Tate, Mr. Bob Tate. Welcome, Bob, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight for uh, another one in the series of live stream broadcasts with uh, Recreational Aviation Australia. How are you tonight? Uh, thanks, Neil. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, um, we're pretty excited about it too. Um, Training is a fundamental part of what... Uh, Recreational Aviation Australia does uh, in, in the mix of our of our member services and operations. Um, but before we get started, um, I just want to um, congratulate you again. Um, you were recognised in the um, in the Queen's Honor, Queen's Birthdays Honours list this year for um, services to aviation education. So um, I think that uh, you know your, your your history in in aviation and your history in aviation training and theory training is is beyond reproach. I think. Uh, there isn't a person or a pilot in Australia and probably worldwide that hasn't heard your name in some form and uh, and studied many of your texts. Um, do you want to give us a bit of a background how all that started and, and where your flying started and, and, and so on and, and your background in teaching? Yes, well, um, I did actually commence um, my career in education department as a school teacher teaching science and maths. But that didn't last long, and finally my love for flying sort of took me down a different path. But I started a flying school called Hinchinbrook Air Services in, uh, in Ingham in North Queensland. And uh, my main interest at the time was simply to um, concentrate on flying training itself. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually interested in, in producing much in the way of theory. I wanted to get the flying going and uh, and then I became aware that a lot of the students were dropping out particularly at commercial pilot level because they were having trouble with the theory so I thought well I'll, I'll give them a hand uh, so I began teaching my own students theory as formal lessons aimed at passing the CASA exam and um, uh, I didn't charge them uh, because I could see that it was a log jam that was stopping people from flying. So rather than um, charge them, I simply kept kept them interested and kept them on so they'd do more flying. That was my idea. And uh, the word got around, and finally, uh, finally, uh, people from other schools heard that I was running classes. In those days, by the way, we're talking here about early 1970s. In those days, there was very little choice as to what you would do for theory training, uh, apart from a correspondence course. And so I started getting phone calls from people saying, can we come to the next class? And being the great businessman that I am, I said, yeah, sure, there's no trouble, no charge. And uh, finally, my <laughs> accountant grabbed me, my accountant grabbed me by the ear and said, hey, what are you doing? What on earth are you doing? Uh, and so I started we, we charged, started charging for classes and to my amazement, even more people came because a lot of them wouldn't come because I wasn't charging. And uh, so eventually uh, uh, we had a very active school going that produced living students from all over Australia in flying training. And, and I also got a, uh, I was appointed as a, what they in those days they called a flight test officer, which meant I could, I was one of the first around who could not only train my students, but actually examine them and issue the license. Not issue the license, of course, but conduct the test and recommend them to CASA. And, uh, and so that, that meant we had a, a roaring, uh, a rip roaring little uh, school going that where people could come from the country. A lot of them came from out west and uh, do all the theory and uh, and all the flying and get tested and never have to face up to CASA at any point. So it was a, that's where I got started. But uh, my main interest at that time was actually flying training. It's um, it's, um, it's interesting, isn't it? Interesting, that, isn't that theory, theory training, as I recall, I think I was 15 and the flight school was just a normal flight school. You'd rock up and do your lessons and you'd be referred to some pretty old texts from the day and some of some of the real old 1940s military stuff in some cases. But uh, I think it was a TAFE school that I remember doing a, a six-week course and 
of course, some of the subject materials changed, but there was, as you say, there was very little around in terms of theory training. It was like you learn as best as you could from wherever you could grab a book and, and hopefully you just got through the exam. Did you find that there was a, a, a big change in the success rate of people passing the exams once they got some, some proper theory training uh, behind them? Uh, no, no doubt. And I think the other big benefit was uh, theory becomes a lot more alive uh, and interesting, in fact, if, um, if you can talk to them from the point of view of practical experience. But to sit down and read the printed word on the book and not really have any access to hearing stories and, you know, um, uh, sometimes I used to call it teaching by, parallel, by parables. You start off a lesson by telling a story and then that story contains uh, a point that's very important. You can, then you can expect, and at least the students begin to realise that um, this is real, that it is associated with real things. And people can get into all sorts of bother if they if they lack the appropriate knowledge. Yeah, I think you say it on your website, and uh, and, and obviously as a mantra you live by that that understanding the theory is is absolutely imperative in probably it, more in aviation than just about any other industry, um, because you actually can you live and sometimes can die by the by your understanding of the theory and how you apply it in a practical sense. So um, I, yeah, well, look, I think to my mind the key to it all is the student's got to know why he needs to know this. Um, once, once, once a student is starting to learn a whole lot of disjointed facts because he needs to I know that he needs to be able to answer exam questions, you lost the whole point of education. I think they, the student needs, um, he needs to say, well, I, someone tell me why I need to know this and then I'll, I'll put my heart and soul into learning it. And uh, it makes a very big difference. We also used a lot of um, social activity, and that's, I find that's extremely important in any kind of learning environment. Um, students could, students still ring me or contact me sometimes on Facebook or whatever from 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and, and say, you know, I'm now in Qantas or whatever, uh, but I'll never forget those parties, I'll never forget, I'll never forget the songs we sang. I'll never forget the social atmosphere as well as what I learned. So that's an important thing, I think. Do you think that's changed a little bit in the flight training environment these days where people just time poor, they rock up for their flight lesson and possibly do some of their theory back at home and, and, and they don't immerse themselves in that experience where they do learn those valuable mentoring lessons? Yeah. I, I suspect um, more so in GA, in, um, where you've got the big sort of what I sometimes call the supermarket type flying schools where it's all crank the handle and out comes a pilot at the other end. And, um, so I think in that, in that regard, some of that very important social associations um, are lacking. And uh, it was very noticeable, for example, throughout the 80s particularly and, and back in those years, People would often, there were, I guess there wasn't so much competition for students' time either, but students would often come out and spend, they wouldn't do their hours flying, they'd come out and spend the day at the aerodrome and they'd sit around the lounge and have drink coffee and tell lies and, and maybe even scrounge your backseat ride and uh, you know, go, and go to the bar later. Um, that type of thing, people just seem to have busier lives now and there's a lot more competition for their spare time. I totally agree and I think, you know, you've just recalled a lot of my early training where I sat around the aero club and then scrounged lawn mowing money to go and get a backseat ride until I eventually could get in the front seat of the old, of the old 172 or whatever. So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's it's great to, to recall some of those things. And many of our members will uh, that have been around a while in flying and, and have either migrated to recreational flying or or have built careers out of it will recall those 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 heady days of, of the early training environment. So I might just um thanks Bob. That's it's a it's a great insight and um you know it's and obviously set you up well for the sort of things that pilots need to learn. Um uh, what can I ask um prompted you to write a specific training theory text for recreational pilots as opposed to commercial pilots? 
Well, as far as um, RIA and what we now call GI are concerned, I sometimes think it's a rather a shame that we differentiate and categorise uh, as though they're two separate activities. We're all aviators. We all we all we all operate in the same sky. Uh, we all suffer the same consequences for uh, incapacity or neglect. And so, uh, in a way, we we should sort of look upon each other as two sides of the same coin, not not two separate activities. And let's face it, the average RAA aeroplane now is way up there with GA when it comes to both technology and performance. Um, most are, many RAA aeroplanes now are you know, very sophisticated in terms of the technology they've got, and glass cockpits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there's really a smudging of the boundary, maybe in terms of, of organisational um, aspects like uh, the, the people involved in administering. Uh, apart from that, when it comes to the practical business of flying aeroplanes, there's a, there's a smudgy line between RAA and GA, I think. I totally agree, and and we're seeing that more and more every day. That the the convergence of what was traditionally ultralight flying is now just really part of the general aviation sector, whether it's be for private and recreational use or for training. Uh, we've got uh, probably close to thirty flight schools out of our hundred and sixty flight schools that are immersed heavily in both systems under under the CASA training system as well as recreational aviation, and uh, and 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 people will make choices to either stay in one or the other, or have they got the capacity to migrate as either a career development or just as part of their natural, their training progression. So yeah. having a theory text that actually gives them enough of a substantial underpinning knowledge in the recreational yeah. space is a, is of great value. And uh, our members have got access to that and uh, through, through your own um, network of um, distribution, but we're also to be a proud, uh, a proud distributor of uh, the recreational text for navigation and BAK as well. Well, originally, um, RAA pilots started accessing our material uh, when the material was still really just for private pilot licence for what, in, what was then called BAK exam and uh, private pilot. And um, a lot of a lot of uh, RAA pilots were were using our material, even though it wasn't specifically written for them. But of course, there's a great deal of transfer across from one to the other uh, of common. There's a whole lot of common knowledge. But but these, um, it was really uh, mainly that I got to know some of the, the operators, the the uh, businesses, as well as the students. And I thought, well, there's a there is a need to have a uh, a book or a series of study guides that were aimed specifically at RAA operations. And so that's um, that's where we sort of largely in response to, to you, your uh, people, it's a credit to you guys that um, you saw the problem with with uh, a lack of uniformity throughout the, the industry and um, different schools tending to go their different ways and sort of even to the point of probably um, employing different standards uh, and so it was largely in response to your approach to us that we began to see the, the benefit of and to me it would be a great thrill to think that that we'd have a uh, we can pull the whole industry into one one um, resource in terms of theory and provision and that gives you a lot more opportunity to control it and to maintain the uh, standards that you want. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that RAOs is, is mindful of is that we we ourselves are an administrating body, but the real knowledge is in our partnerships and in the people that we can work with like yourself. And uh, and and if we, we choose the appropriate partner who's got a platform that's been progressive, that's multi-layered, as in, you know, it's the physical text as well as uh, online content and also with some of the new innovations, which we'll talk, I'd like to talk to you about in a minute, moment about your, um, your video streaming and your video um, uh, lessons. We saw that as the ideal partnership as we ourselves grow to become a, a better training provider and, and, and standing on the shoulders of giants, as it were, is, is probably where we can benefit our members and, uh, and bring that and do that little bit to bring the industry together. Yeah. 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 No, I think, that's, uh, I think that's one of the great um, benefits of, of the association between ourselves and you that, uh, you know, we can... Uh, we can provide the the, the 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 raw material, if you like, uh, to allow a uniform approach when it comes to theory training. We've um, I've got a whole bunch more questions I want to ask, and I'm sure we're getting lots of interest. Uh, Michael Bruzy has just come up with a very interesting question, and he's just said, "Are we placing too high an expectation on instructors to explain theory in detail?" on top of the text. Um, they're already stretch teaching and, and particularly in the recreational space, a lot of our um, instructors, they're doing it part-time, they're, they're, they're often very busy, just managing the flight component. Um, how do you see that the integration of this online study, being able to take some of that theory responsibility away from the tax instructor? So that when they do the short brief, the student is well prepared to go out and, and understand what they're doing and then flight, get the maximum benefit out of the flight lesson. That's exactly true. I uh, I couldn't agree more. That if we, you know, we don't. You, you're you're in a very um, enviable position in the, in RAA, and because you you got a lot more control over the actual exam content, um, and and it's a, I would think it's a simpler matter for you to respond and be nimble in terms of of examinations. Uh, the students will follow the exam. There's no doubt about that. You know, if, if you're going to set exams on, on obscure topics, the students will have to learn those things. But So it's very much a matter of making sure the exams themselves are up to scratch. But I do understand that um, it's a difficult thing for students, for uh, instructors as well. You've got a busy day as an instructor. You've, you've got a student who's raring to go. You need to go fly. You can't. You don't want to spend unnecessary amount of time, particularly on unnecessarily complex issues. Uh, I've often said, you know, flying isn't a hard thing to do. It's, you know, when they try to put aviation in the same boat as science, well, it's not. It's, uh, aviation is industrial education. It's, you're, teaching someone, you're teaching someone how to operate a machine. That's what you're doing. You know, it, it's not academic. And and all, the odd student will have an academic capacity and, if, and it's great if the instructor can present material mathematically or in the form of graphs. But everything that can be said mathematically, everything that can be said with a formula can also be said in simple English. Yeah. Uh, it can't, it probably yeah. has no place in the syllabus. We say that, and I actually wrote that in our instructor training manual, that if you can't explain something simply enough, you don't understand it um, well enough yourself. And I think it's in the simplicity that the true learning comes. It's not in the complexity, because aviation can get very complex, and we've even got two schools of thought about how lifts produced still, still today. So um, it, it's, it's, and it becomes a good bar and brawl at the end of a flying day, I think. Yeah, well, the demands of, the demands of theory shouldn't shouldn't oversh overshadow the instructor's capacity to bring his own personality and his own experience into it and to me that's a, that's the key of a good instructor you can if you, if you can bring up stories of your own it doesn't have to be you personally but stories you've picked up in your life as you progressed and and make sure that every theory lesson is linked to some kind of practical outcome something that really did happen once. I can remember many many years ago, a student of mine, he got his commercial licence and he ended up in New Guinea flying in the Highlands. And uh, 
I spoke to him years later and he's telling me this horror story of how he got into some bother. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm, my brain flashed back to the talks we used to have. And he said, I've forgotten the graph and I've forgotten the formula, but I remembered the story. And, and it's because I remembered the story that I, I was able to, to find a, a great deal of help and comfort in that situation. So stories, yeah. stories of real things uh, are vitally important in, in pilot education, I think. And, and isn't that amazing that, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised that you that linking is so strong in your thinking. Um, here you are, a, a premium provider and probably the premier provider of, of, of aviation theory training in Australia. And yet you still acknowledge that it's the practical transition that, that makes all the difference. And, and I agree. It's, uh, it's, it, what, it's where the boots, it's where the rubber hits the road that matters and it's where the air meets the, where the, where the, where the wing meets the air that, that really matters. It's not all in, in the graphs and formulas. Yeah. Um, and I think, what, again, I, I really do believe that you've got a wonderful opportunity uh, in the way you're association is structured that um, you're able to you should be able to ensure that the exams follow that route and and remain as practical as possible i've always said you know if you want to know how much somebody knows about a topic you don't ask them two hard questions you ask them 50 easy ones if, we were only ask, just having this discussion today about the, the way that some double barrel questions are asked in multiple choice yeah, exams yeah. And, 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 and we were sitting down saying when we do our exam, um, uh, we look at our pool of exam questions in consultation with your BAK questions that we're going to use is making sure that there are no ones that are just trying to confuse the student. We're not here to confuse them. We want to make sure that they've got a, a relatively comprehensive understanding um, yeah. of, of, the, of the bit that's going to matter to them in the air. Thank goodness, thank goodness some of the worst of those days has gone, but, you know, CAS is a lot more difficult to deal with on that regard because uh, nobody's got any real input into, into the content of exams. And so so um, this is where I think you've got a wonderful opportunity that you can... You can realise the problems and uh, and adjust accordingly. You know, you can adjust the the wording and the like. I said, you know, a lot of simple questions as the way to find out how much someone knows. Not not exactly. some, not write an essay on one topic. You know, yeah. you know what 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 are the factors affecting the centripetal centripetal force in a turn or something like that. You know, you, you can say all that in much simpler terms. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, bum in the, bum in the seats type stuff. Uh, but having said all that, your exams are approved by CASA as, as approved exams for, be, for, the, for the subjects you teach. And obviously, you've got a suite yeah. of exams and, and theory that runs right up to the IREX. So uh, that's, that's, it may necessarily be beyond most of our members, um, but some of our members will go on to actually have commercial and airline careers and, and in fact, are using recreational flight training as the, uh, the nursery or the jumping pad to start that career. So um, yeah. having that, having knowing that we've got a, a partner and knowing that you provide a, an exam set that's that's approved by CASA does give us some assurance that as pilots migrate, they know that they're getting a level of theory understanding that they that they can count on when it goes if they progress on with their flight careers. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's obvious um, when you look around that that's becoming a popular choice that pilots are making, mainly because of the cost saving. Um, of entering uh, entering commercial aviation via the RAA pathway. That makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. So I might move on and just, um, it's a great discussion and I just want to ask you, uh, are there any focus areas that you see pilots need need to have a better underpinning knowledge where, where you sort of still see in your involvement in the industry that, that there's some deficiencies that pilots just haven't quite got, whether it be management of low speed environment, the drag, what the drag curve really means on an approach and how it can catch you out. Are there any areas that you see, Bob, in your, in, in, you know, you've been doing this for a long time now? Yeah, well, uh, well, firstly, I think there's a, there is a limit to what you can do in the, between the covers of a book. Um, 
in the in in the regard of um, of students getting more practical sort of information, I think it's also going to be necessary for the operators to provide specific type specific information um, when it, when it comes to things like most RAA aircraft, for example, uh, ignition systems and uh, and sometimes fuel systems are quite different to uh, the average GA airplane. So that's that's the sort of stuff that uh, can be de dealt with on the spot by the by the school that's training on that particular aircraft type. And uh, so that's what also, of course, um, videos, um, the videos, our videos that we're producing now for we just finished private pilot videos and uh, I think that'll be a reasonably good resource for uh, for RAA pilots as well uh, and I'd like to see one day maybe we could even uh, look at getting some of your RAA instructors to um, to start looking at the idea of producing uh, videos that are specific specifically related to uh, to RAA, the RAA environment. It, it's a very good point, and, we, and we're already down that path. You're probably aware, as our members are, that we've, got, we've uh, entered into a collaboration with GoFly Online, and yeah. members have got access to uh, a, a very good range of RAOS-focused um, video training presentations, so they can actually see that flight lesson as it plays out, and they can they can watch it time and time again, look at the high horizon references, the scanning techniques, the control handling, in a real sense, so that when they get in the cockpit, for that hour of precious flying, there's a certain familiarity because of this visual relationship that we we as humans tend to really relate to and sponge up in terms of learning. So yeah, we've got that and we've also got, um, as you know, RAOs, we did, uh, in fact, I did some stuff on loss of control where we got in the cockpit and threw a plane around in sort of typical scenarios where pilots tend to lose control near the ground. And um, it's, it, it's, it's, as you say, I think it relates back to what you said before, the practical understanding, seeing it with your own eyes in the cockpit and, and then saying, oh, now I get why that, what that means. That's, that's be, and I think today it's even more important, whereas the younger generation, the millennials and, and so on, are such visual learners because of all the, elect, the electronic technology that's out there. They're learning through visual immersion. You're, talk, you're talking to people who've got quite different, brain processes. Uh, I've been in education right back from, from school days with teaching teaching kids at school and, and following that path all the way through to today. It, it's a totally different, totally different person that you're talking to now. Uh, and you've got to be careful sometimes that the, that, that culture gap, if you like, uh, you've got to remain aware of it because um, so often students don't even our language you know it doesn't it doesn't make sense uh, i made a mistake a few years ago of talking about a particular met message and uh i remember i said uh it's a bit like a telegram and they all, <laughs> they all stared at me with their mouths open what the hell's the telegram what are you talking about and so you've got to realise that they, they, they think differently. And uh, in some cases, there are disadvantages, but mostly it's, mostly it's better, I think. Yeah, For it's... Example, um... There you go. No, you're right. <laughs> uh, well, one thing I've, I've found that um, is quite interesting is um, with the aid of calculators, that all of the students, even at CPL level, by the way, all of the students can do wonderful things if they have to multiply, divide or add or subtract. But the problem comes when they have to work out when to multiply and when to divide and when to add and when to subtract. And that's, that's a calculator doesn't do that for you. The calculator, you've got to choose which operation you want, but you have to know why you're doing it. And so sometimes there's a bit of a gap there compared to, say, years ago when people did a lot more 
or manual mathematical uh, material. But I'm certainly not saying that they're that they're you know, less capable. They certainly are, but they, they, you've got to have a different approach to it. Sometimes you have to say things that are blindingly obvious. Almost, it's almost an embarrassment to have to say it. But uh, then you find later they, a lot of them said, "Thank goodness she said that because I wasn't sure about it." Yeah, yeah the, the challenges of generational change in 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 just in so, in society, I guess, and aviation is not immune from that either. It's a uh, it being a more complex learning environment, I guess it's uh, it's got more vulnerability as well. Well, look at look at look at simulators and things like that today. That um, you know, when I did my instrument rating hundred years ago, feels like anyway. Um, CASA, the, the idea with CASA or DCA in those days, just how far back it goes, the idea with DCA examiners, etc., was you know, if you're not ex-military. Why on earth did you want an instrument rating? You know, what right have you got to want to fly around on instruments? That's a special skill. And uh, and now look at what happens with the uh, simulators and the, the home simulators that students have access to today. And they uh, they can do they can do amazing things, and it doesn't require military type training. That anybody can learn to fly safely. Uh, on instruments it's a different world absolutely and I, I wanted to ask you about that um, I'm glad you raised it how do you see simulation training um, adding value particularly in the current changing environment with those sort of technologies how do you see simulation aiding or do you, and, and how and do you see it aiding the way that we can deliver training to get better understanding and habits like whether it be radio procedures or or recognising an upset state or or flying an approach like you would at the higher levels like you're talking about. What are your thoughts on that? Well, all of those things, of course, uh, in the world of, of I, I believe, in the world of practical flying training, it, it's very hard to get a lot of that material across purely in a, in a, in a presentation in a class situation. But, um, you know... What I was saying earlier was about um, technology, uh, who would ever have believed? And I just look in my lifetime, the span of my life, which unfortunately is quite large now. But um, that's, that's a good I, thing, Bob. <laughs> I just look at and I think to myself, I like to fly in a tiger moth in, in Cairns in North Queensland. Um, the tower had light signals, you know, and um, and if you wanted to go flying, you you, you got and sat on the tiger moth, and someone swung the prop, and you you looked at the tower, and the tower thought, oh, it looks like it might want to go somewhere, so it'd give you green flashes and clear the taxi. Um, and yet, when I I've I've been able to see all those years of change to a situation now where if I want to fly to a particular Telegraph pole in Alice Springs, I can do it um, with the GPS with extreme accuracy. I don't even need a map. And uh, I can't believe, it's hard to believe you've seen those changes. So the, the world that these guys are growing up in is totally different to the one that we experienced. Absolutely agreed, and I think our members out there are uh, are embracing that. And uh, and some of us older instructors and pilots, we we find it a challenge to to not to go back to rule of thumb and 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 embrace some of the tools and techniques that are available. And I think some of the electronic flight bag applications that are that are pretty well common in just about every cockpit now um, are a good example of that. You know, freeing up the pilot to be able to make better decisions, but giving them the resources that. That, that balance it out rather than distract their, their operation, you know? Yeah. Well, see, what? when it comes right. to, uh, when it comes to things like cross country flying, um, it's, it's hard to believe that people once upon a time bounced around the bush with a, a whack chart on their lap and looked out the window and tried to navigate by dead reckoning, um, Whereas now 
with the advent of GPS, and let's face it, GPS is here to stay. It's not going to go away. Uh, and so, uh, but it's still important for uh, a student to have some understanding of the basic principles behind it. But I find that a bit difficult myself, to be honest, that, um, you know, whenever you, I, I did a flight with a friend of mine once a while ago uh, to Thursday Island uh, and, and through central Queensland. And we were having a drink in the bar at Thursday Island and, that night. And uh, we suddenly realised that between us, we had six GPSs on board the aircraft. Yeah, the aircraft itself had two. And then each of us had a, uh, uh, a mobile phone and a, and a lap and a, an iPad. And so people say, what's going to happen if the GPS fails? So, well, I'll go to one of the other five. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to be too smart there because I do accept that it, it makes a lot of sense to be able to navigate. But to, to stay current in, in, in that type of navigation is still going to be um, unlikely, I would think, you know, because it's just... GPS is everywhere, everywhere you turn. So on that point, Bob, have you incorporated some of the some of the electronic devices like um, tablets and, and flight plan bags into your training? How, how do you see that we as training providers can actually make better use of practical training? Because these, as you say, they're not going away. Everybody's got one. Um, have you modified any of your training um, theory delivery to include flight bag use and, and, and so on? Or? Only to the extent that um, people need to be able to uh, have some basic understanding. I'm thinking now mainly of instrument flying, actually. Um, let's face it, uh, you're wasting your time trying to, uh, not only that, you're probably not even capable of saying too much about how a GPS works. You know, I, I don't know how it works. Um, all you can talk about is what are, you know, what are the procedures involved in using it? So it, go, it fits more comfortably into ELOR than it does into some kind of technical presentation. You turn it on. I mean, you know, a VOR, in the old days, I remember we used to say to the students, a VOR, you, uh, you turn it on, and if the uh, flag doesn't say off, then you use it. And uh, it's got its it's got errors, and it's got its limitations. But those limitations and errors are built into the into the operating procedures. So when I do an instrument approach, the the dis, the height I can I'm allowed to come down to has already accounted for the errors that might exist. So I don't care what the errors are. Is it working? Is it tuned to the right station? Turn on, tune in, identify, and test. We used to say. You know, and I don't care why it works. So maybe we should put more emphasis on the operational side, and that would be nowadays easily done with uh, simulators. Yeah, I, th I think so, and um, it's certainly an area I'm looking to do some development work with external partners in simulation that covers some of these areas, Bob. Um, we might move on. We've been going for a little while and this tends to happen. And uh, as long as uh, I've got a few more questions, which I think our members might like to ask. Um, one I did want to throw out at you is um, with exams, what are the common mistakes that you see candidates make when they're answering questions? So um, I think there'll be a lot of people out there that, that have had frustrated answers and, and done yeah. it. So I got that right. How could that, that answer's wrong. The questions are wrong. Um, what's the common right. ones that you see? Yeah, there's two right answers. Yeah. yeah that's it. <laughs> uh, now, of course, one thing I have to accept, we all have to accept, is that a multiple choice type exam, which is the favoured, is the, the way exams are conducted nowadays, a multiple choice exam is very easy to mark, but very difficult to write. There's, there's a, um, it's a lot harder to write, a, a, I'm talking about a valid question, a valid multiple choice question, not not um, not just something you throw up on the board and you know have a bit of a giggle on it. To make one that an educational psychologist 
would accept as being valid as a multiple choice. That's very hard to do. And so um, inevitably, any, any multiple choice type exam relies heavily on the student's ability to comprehend English. And I'm afraid that won't ever change. While ever the exams are done, if you could sit with, at a desk with each student and verbally examine them, you'd get a totally different result, particularly now with such a high percentage of overseas students. So, so you um, think it's in their comprehension of the question, just reading the question twice, clearly articulating in their mind what the question's are asking? There, there, there are two things. The, one is, of course, the very famous old expression of RTFQ, uh, which stands for read the jolly question, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we mean read the question. Um, probably a good technique. I think it's got some benefit. Uh, some people cover up the, four ch the choices, if it's multi-choice, and they just read the stem of the question. And then they say, now, what do I reckon the answer would be? If I was talking to my kid brother, what would I tell him? What, this, what would you do in this situation? And then, and then having read it and digested what the question is saying, then look at the, the choices. The other thing, by the way, is uh, I found, uh, I harp on my students with this all the time, um, don't fall for the temptation of answering hundreds and hundreds of specific questions in somebody's book. And they get to the point where they can get 99% on the questions in the back of the book because and they don't realise they've learnt the answers to particular questions. All you have to do is change the wording all you have to do is put a different comma or a different word and they, they're sunk. So there's, it's very important if you're studying for an exam to, uh, oh, sure, I'm not saying that questions aren't important. Of course they are. That They're very important. But uh, it's also very important to read the text, thoroughly read the text and, and, uh, and summarise what, what's being said, even in your own words before you start getting too interested about questions. I have this problem over and over, people saying, you know, but I did the practice exams and I got 80% and I failed the CASA one. Well, I don't, it's hard to give a, an answer to that. It's clear that you've been, you, you were very good at, at answering questions you've seen before. And, it's a very good point, and I think a lot of our um, our members and our listeners tonight will, 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 will hopefully will take that advice from you. But I, I think that's a really good point you've raised, and because it's frustrating, we all have to do exams, and if you're in aviation, you're going to be tested on things throughout your career. So yeah. having having a, some good rules of thumb like that, I think it's just gold, and I I really appreciate and thank you for providing that, Bob. Um, one of the other things is uh, I wanted to talk about, you, you, you've got a very illustrious career as well, recreationally and in aerobatics. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, one of our, our highest accident types is loss of control, particularly in takeoff and landing. And I just wanted to ask your thoughts on how you think we can improve upset recovery awareness for non-aerobatic pilots. So we're not trying to make aerobatic pilots out of, pilot, out of, out of everyone. It's, it's a cup of tea that no, no, I enjoy, no, you no. enjoy. Of course not. I mean, I understand that you have a limit on aerobatic manoeuvres in, in your world. Um, just, just let me say this briefly, though. That I found that st many students I've met who decided they wanted to do aerobatics um, did it with a bit of trepidation, and they said, "Oh, I, I think I'd just like to. I don't want to know that there's something." corner of the performance envelope that I've never been to. I, I, that's, the, you know, that's, that's something I don't understand. So they said, even if I hate it, I want to at least say I've done it. And I found a lot of students who did aerobatics, their general flying improves. They're, they're more willing to say, I will, apply the, I will apply the degree of control input required to get the result I want. I'm not going to sit there pussyfooting saying, or, you know, do, will I move it this way or that way? You say, this is what I want to do, do it, be positive. So aerobatics in that regard is good. Now, okay, I know that's probably no use to um, aeroplanes that can't do aerobatics, but there's a lot can be done within the performance envelope of a particular aircraft 
without physically doing aerobatics. For example, uh, you're talking about loss of control in particular, because that's relevant. You, you don't want to compete in a national championship. So, um, so one thing that I think is a good idea is to talk the student through um, the reasons for, say, a spiral dive. You know, what's going on in a spiral dive? Um, that's one area where some of the theory can be helpful. Uh, the, the interaction between Roll and Yaw, and one feeds off the other. And, uh, and maybe demonstrate the, the actual spiral dive to the extent that the aeroplane will permit, uh, and then the recovery. Um, and most importantly, in a spiral dive, it's going to either be in capacity or in attention. Uh, the modern aeroplane won't enter a spiral dive if the pilot's conscious and he can see outside. And it's, it's just beyond belief that you could do that unless you're actually deprived of outside reference or you are, uh, for some reason, incapacitated. Um, so putting, putting that to them uh, gives them a, a, a more sort of immediate understanding of, of why you're doing it, why it's necessary. And the other thing, um, say, when it comes to spent to uh, stalls, we're not teaching people how to do a stall. We're teaching people how to recognise the symptoms of an impending stall and what you can do to avoid avoid the stall from ever happening. You know, and uh, so perhaps in your aeroplane types, a lot more em emphasis on those areas. Uh, would be some benefit, but it, it certainly is a it certainly is a pity in a way that uh, that you you can't expose people to actual aerobatics. But yeah, and uh, hopefully in the future when we get uh, a weight increase with our aircraft and start getting some utility utility category aircraft, um, that will be a, a door that can open for us. But I really appreciate your thoughts on that. It's um, something we're working a lot on in terms of upset recovery and, and advanced um, flight techniques. So we're, we're, going to, we're building a program at the moment. One of my new roles as uh, head of training development is to actually build some more innovative training packages that will encourage pilots to advance their skills. And uh, and we're going to uh, basically do a lot of work in that area about upset recovery, about advanced control management, and include that, particularly for pilots that are probably approaching 100 hours, have done their endorsements, got a nav, and are probably looking for something to an itch to scratch to, to, to enjoy it and to test them a little bit more and, and, get, and get through that 100-hour syndrome. So... Um, yeah. We'll, uh, and of course, our, our instructors, we want to make sure that they're completely comfortable, as you say, and competent when, if for some reason they do get, get outside the envelope, that they're, they're confident in how to recover that um, to, to, to manage a successful outcomes. Uh, so uh, thanks, Bo. I appreciate all that and your thoughts on that. That was a, I dived off the, the edge there into the aerobatic um, world because I know of your experience there and I, I think your input and your, your, your comments are really worthy. Um, I guess we're, uh, we're, there's a few things we want to talk about. Um, obviously, we, we talked about the collaboration. Um, Katie will pop up. We've got uh, your, your, your recreational texts um, through our, uh, our, our shop, our eShop uh, online, and they, they, our members can get access to that directly through, uh, through our pilot shop. And uh, our schools have also got a special, uh, uh, we have a, a special arrangement with our schools as well. So um, we're encouraging schools to use the Bob Tate theory as the default theory training references um, through the network. And we're building, obviously, with your assistance we're, and Stuart's assistance, who I haven't mentioned yet, your son Stuart, we're, we're doing a lot of work where we're going to be using the on, uh, building the online component. So we'll actually have a full layered platform of online exams online study resources and of course the texts. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, uh, I, uh, I'll leave this last question for a moment, but uh, I also want to mention just briefly uh, in housekeeping, we've got our scholarship program open. And I think when we talk about the mentoring and development, one of the things that's about industry support 
and RAOS is proud with uh, a range of sponsors that support us financially to provide a, a very uh, active scholarship program. We've probably got some listeners tonight that have um, that have been recipients of our scholarship program. The uh, the applications are, are currently open. Uh, Cody can put up on the screen for us the um, the address that's on our website. Um, we're accepting applications for our next uh, round of uh, scholarships, and uh, I believe they'll be announced in. Uh, later in the year, I won't put the time up. I haven't got it off the top of my head, but uh, we'll we'll get that up there. Um, and of course, we mentioned before the GoFly Online Association, which is the the online video training resources, which uh, which builds that bridge between the theoretical training and and the actual practical. How does this look in the air? And what am I going to see when I do this? And uh, and what it looks like. So again, those resources are available to our members on the on the uh, website. We've got a question here from um, from uh, Wounded Duck Aviation. Um, Bob, do you think that there are still good things to come using this type of technology to prepare for exams? Oh, it's from Rob Glenn. <laughs> G'day, Rob. How are you? So um, we all know. We all know, we all know, we all know yeah, Rob. Hundred percent. Yes. I. I. It all. It largely. I mean, the the capacity is there. The technology is there. It's up to us to. To make sure we use it to uh, the best extent, but uh, yeah, I, I think the future's rosy. I'm not a, I, I'm not a doom and gloomer. Um, most of what, most of the progress I've seen in aviation in my life um, has been has been heading in the right direction. I think, and then, of course, you have hiccups here and there, but most of it is most of it is good stuff, and I'm, I'm sure we'll continue to apply those technologies to everybody's benefit. Yeah, we've got to, I, I know I agree with you. And I think, um, you know, the video presentations, particularly at the moment with so much restriction in face to face training, I think um, your uh, your online theory training, your online uh, your online briefings have just been a godsend to to people to continue their training development and their theory training development. And who'd have thought we'd be we'd be relying on this so heavily uh, less than six months ago. Yep. So uh, Paul O'Rourke's uh, popped a question up here. Bob, do you think uh, ab initio training is being linked back to effective controls for every ensuing lesson undertaken to positively consolidate learning? I think that's a question we talk about a lot, about linking everything back to primacy. It's all about understanding that effects of controls in, in primary, yep. secondary and further effects. What are your thoughts on that, Bob? Absolutely. And, and uh, after all, um, the controls are the the link between the human brain and the actual aeroplane control surfaces, which which is what flying is all about. Um, of course, it's very difficult to talk about almost any any uh, aspect of flying training without uh, going back to the basic control inputs. So yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, it's um, and and we and we're looking at our syllabus and how we can reinvigorate that that understanding, and we encourage our schools through our professional development programs to focus on what I call the the six pack, the core six lessons leading up to stalling, and how all those controls interact together um, for for virtually everything we do in an aeroplane. And I like your analogy that it's it's what links our brain to the aeroplane. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Well, yeah, you've got that one there. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, which is a good one, actually. Um, and uh, I agree. And I agree because one of the problems, as I've tried to say a number of times tonight, one of the problems is the fact that um, the exams themselves that have, to, have to, they have to actually set the, the pace, you know, to... Uh, what we want the students to know and understand. Uh, but yes, outdated is completely correct. Um, and mind you, I, I can't help but think now in terms of, of uh, general aviation uh, exams with CASA. Uh, but yes, there are a lot of areas in, in the exams that are completely out of date. I don't, as I've said a number of times, uh, the RAA is in a better position because you've got much more access to the levers to control and change the exam um, emphasis. 
So uh, it's it's really up to the people who set the exams to overcome that problem. But it, it is a shame that that in some cases there are you know really badly uh, outdated areas that 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 are still in exams because they sort of always were traditionally. Exams have to respond to the to the current environment that we fly in, and and more importantly to the current aeroplanes and the systems that are used to control them. So it's something you have to do. I don't know what you can do about that. You know, it'd be nice if you could. The only thing is that it, it has to come from with from the people who are setting the exams. Yeah, I totally agree, and it's that's my challenge over the next um, two years is to go through and rewrite our exams. And um, fundamentally, it, you know, they're not broken, but there's a lot of areas we can improve them and also innovate with some of the new areas that you talk about. And uh, Michael uh, Brizzy's raised another question about uh, the e-learning platform. That's very much what RAOS is um, under my tutelage is going to be running through is setting up uh, a full learning management system in collaboration with Bob Tate's theory. Um, but also building on that with our own ear ledge, which we'll, we'll be sharing with Bob, and uh, also including video elements and e-learning elements so pilots can get a total online learning experience that, that actually supports the flight training rather than just for the purpose of theory in itself, which has been yeah. the core yeah. thread of what we've been talking about tonight right. together, Bob. Right. That, that seems to be more uh, aimed at the pre-flight briefing environment um, the I, I think you know it is true that the the theory's got to try. We've got to try very hard to make sure the theory does uh, dovetail neatly into the actual practical flying experience. Because one thing that I've always found a little annoying is um, the the fact that there are some areas of theory that are shut up and learn it because you're going to get exam questions on it. And that doesn't really do much for enthusiasm. Not and at all. Also, it's time wasting. What's what's the point? So it yeah. again goes back to the question itself, the exam questions. Yeah. Exactly right. I'm gonna, I, I left the last one and look, we'll wrap up now. And uh, I want to thank everybody for the um, for, for people online that have participated. Great questions tonight, Bob. Um, can't thank you enough. But I have a final question I wanted to ask you, and then I'll just do. Uh, a couple of housekeeping reminders in addition to the ones I've mentioned. Um, Bob, for, what's your number one piece of advice that you could offer to pilots for staying safe in the air? Okay, good question. Um, firstly, let me say this. Safety is not just a characteristic that's built into the machine. Safety is a frame of mind of the human pilot. Safety is an attitude, and attitudes are not learnt. Attitudes are acquired by immersion in a safety-conscious environment. You acquire an attitude. You don't actually learn it as, as a mental exercise. So there's just as much responsibility with the flying training organisation and its staff and when it comes to uh, safety as the responsibility for the aircraft manufacturer and the pilot, <clears throat> they've all got, they've all got um, a part to play in safety. But it's a, it's, a general, it's a general environment you're operating in that keeps reinforcing the importance of safety. So that's what I think is probably the most important single thing. I think they're the wisest words ever said, and 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 I'm sure, I know it's been said in different ways by different people, but I think you've put it up, uh, you've explained it eloquently. Thank you, Bob. Um, I want to thank you um, on behalf of RAOs and our members and our viewers for um, for joining us tonight. It's been a great hour. We've been here an hour. Um, and uh, I could spend another hour just talking to you, and I'm sure we, as we will and do uh, offline and other things. But um, uh, just a reminder, if anybody wants to get in direct contact with Bob for any of his theory training, they can uh, contact Bob Tate via his web website, um, and his details are up on the screen. And also, if anybody wants to uh, uh, purchase the text, they can do that straight from our website. 
uh, and um, we, you'll see them rolled out and you are already are seeing them rolled out through a fairly substantial part of our training network already. And, and don't, uh, don't, don't, don't forget, by the way, that we we have a forum on our webpage and, uh, and that's open to RAA people as well as anyone else. And there are thousands of posts on that forum that over the years, all a huge amount of information in there. So, you know, you welcome. You guys are welcome to use that if uh, if you want to. Well, thank you, and I know, our, I know many of our members will. So, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder. So, um, just coming up. Uh, I think next week so on Wednesday night, same time, we've got our um, board nominees uh, stream uh, live stream as well. That continues um, part two. Uh, we talked about the scholarship program. If you haven't downloaded the details from the website, go and have a look. If you're eligible, we'd love to get an application. And um, thank you very much, Bob. We'll, um, we're, we've got lots of work to do together in the future, as you know. And uh, I want to thank uh, Cody in the background for helping facilitate. He does a great job, as always. And um, thank you to our members and uh, to all the other people that have uh, signed in tonight and taken up time in their night to actually uh, sit down and, and have a great conversation with, um, with Bob Tate. Thanks, Bob. And um, we'll, we'll see you in the air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.